where he recently uh, joined. And he's also affiliated with the Max Perutz Lab in Vienna, the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. And today it's a pleasure that he's presenting the third Allot webinar. This is part of the Allosterin in Drug Discovery IPN uh, series. And uh, today he will be talking about biophysical screening and evaluation of allosteric modulators of bacterial and mammalian lectins. So we're really, really looking forward uh, to your talk. Thank you, Zoe, for the nice words of introduction. Um, so what I'm trying to do is to give a more educational talk here, uh, which summarizes what we have been doing using biophysical methods um, to understand first of all for screening, and then also to understand allosteric modulators, which we happen to find uh, more, more frequently than we anticipated. And the targets that we're using in the lab are uh, bacterial and mainly uh, mammalian lectins. So I will focus on our work on mammalian lectins, but in the end, I will also give an example for a bacterial lectin where we have found allosteric modulators. Um, <clears throat> and to um, to motivate uh, where our interest in lectins is coming from, uh, let me show you uh, the next slide. So here um, you can see the three major lectin families in, in mammals. So this is uh, the galactins you can see here on the right side. These are galactose binding lectins, um, siglex, they are silic acid binding lectins, and C-type lectins. This will be the focus of my talk. But overall, um, because they are very... Uh, let's say not so prominent as, as drug targets so far, uh, let me um, highlight why we are interested in them and uh, why others are. Uh, so because for instance, for the galactins, they are involved in angiogenesis, fibrosis and cardiovascular diseases. And there are uh, quite a number of biotech and also larger companies are now investing into this drug space. For the Siglex, um, they, they have been targeted already for a long time. Uh, for, so they're marketed drugs for uh, CIGLEC-2 and CIGLEC-3, for non-Hodgkin lymphoma, as well as for AML. And it became even more prominent with the discovery of the role of CIGLEC-15 as an immune checkpoint. You can imagine where this, this research is going. And on the other hand, we have C-type lectins. So uh, calcium uh, coordinating, calcium binding lectins that coordinate carbohydrate structures and they have been out there as drug targets for quite a while. Also, uh, the most prominent drugs you can see here from Anilem, uh, all of these use the selective expression of the acyl glycoprotein receptor on hepatocytes for the delivery of siRNA drugs. On the other hand, um, other uh, C-type lectins like the selectins have been a focus for anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory drugs as well as others for uh, the development of a novel adjuvants. So overall, uh, the more we learn about carbohydrate binding proteins, the more interesting they become for the development of um, drugs or therapeutics. And um, my main focus here is, let's say from a biological perspective, is um, the development of targeted delivery uh, uh, vehicles. And here we benefit from the properties of many of the glycan uh, binding proteins that they are specifically or at least overexpressed on certain cell subsets. So as I mentioned already, hepatocytes um, express the ASGPR, the acyloglycoprotein receptor. Uh, many immune cells do similar things. So platelets have a high expression of PLEG2 and our main focus in the lab are Langerhans cells, which have a high expression of lung green. So we could use these lectins on the surface expressed of, uh, in this case, immune cells for delivering drugs uh, to these cells to manipulate uh, their physiology. So for the C-type lectins, as I said, they all have this um, shared fold. It's a double-stranded uh, anti-parallel beta sheet in the, in the center here, and it coordinates calcium. And this calcium then coordinates the sugar hydroxyl groups at least in those cases where carbohydrates are involved uh, in the recognition of these C-type lectins. You can find the C-type lectin-like fold structures in many, many proteins um, in, in mammals. So it's, I think it's over 600 proteins. For those that really coordinate uh, calcium and bind to carbohydrates, it's maybe 20 or 30 of them. And for this, uh, I think I hear somebody not muted. 
Anyhow, uh, so for this for this talk, we will focus here on the group two. So DC sine and Langerine will be in this group of multivalently displayed C-type lectins on the surface of immune cells. But again, there are many other uh, C-type le like lectins that are involved in lipid binding, protein binding. So we can understand the fold more like a general binding fold that binds to all sorts of things, including urea crystals, cholesterol crystals, and so on. Okay, but from our perspective, from the molecular drug targeting perspective, what we would like to do is to develop small molecules that would bind specifically to one uh, subset of cells mediated by the C-type lectins and their specific expression on cell surfaces, allowing the delivery, for instance, of novel vaccines or adjuvants uh, for treatment of autoimmune diseases or allergies, or let's say in general, RNA delivery, SI RNA delivery, or just a killing of a certain uh, cell subset. And here, just to give you an some information why, why we do this and how far we can move uh, to the clinics with these small molecules before we go into the biophysics of things. Let me just show you one example where we're focusing on, lung re uh, on Langerhans cells. So in this case, the Langerhans cells are the uh, dendritic-like cells in Hello. your skin. Excuse me? I'm going. I think you have somebody has to okay, mute themselves. Good. I can't do this. Hey, Yorgo, can you please mute the person? Okay, sorry. Um, okay, let, let me start here. So, again, so uh, we're focusing on the lung and cells, these are immune cells in your skin that protect you from invading pathogens. And so, we can, uh, if we find small molecules, we could use them for targeted delivery of, of novel vaccines. And the interesting thing about lung and cells is, hold on, that they're involved in many pathologies of the skin like psoriasis, uh, chronic wound healing and scarring, as well as uh, the infection with um, bacteria, fungi and viruses, and their involvement in different types of, of cancer. So delivering therapeutics in general to these cells is, is a, a prime interest to us. And our research in this field started from uh, knowledge that uh, this receptor would bind to uh, substructures of heparin. So you can see uh, heparin up here. So it's a uh, charged uh, carbo carbohydrate structure. So we based our knowledge on work that has been done by Frank Fieschi and Jesus Angulo and others in the field. And we identified small subsets of these complex carbohydrate structures, which could be a starting point for our endeavor to find small molecule ligands for that, um, for that protein. So you can see some substructures uh, associated with the KIs. And for synthetic reasons, we started with this uh, um, sulfonamide of the uh, glucosamine over here. So um, we had a small SAR and I don't wanna go into details here. I just wanna tell you what we do with these ligands. So we had a, a small structure activity relationship of a number of analogs um, in, in the two position and using saturation transfer difference NMR, uh, we knew how this ligand would bind into the binding site of langerine. So saturation transfer difference NMR is a technique where you saturate the protein and the saturation will be transferred to the binding and exchanging ligand, leaving an, a negative imprint of, of the protein on the small ligand. So we see that the, um, uh, the tosyl binds very deeply or binds closely to the protein site and the carbohydrate is not, at least the, the linker side over here. And this is what we get from the saturation transfer difference spectra that you can see on the top left side. So together with protein NMR, uh, where we know which resonances or which amino acids are perturbed in the chemical environment upon binding of a small ligand, we could, um, so there's also somebody not muted yet. Maybe Zoe, is this you? Um, we could at least uh, find out uh, who, uh, where the small molecule would bind on the protein side. And so together with this data, we could then deduce a model where the small molecule, the carbohydrate would be coordinated as uh, you would expect it by the calcium ion. And then we have T-stack interaction with this um, uh, phenyl with a tosylate uh, in, the, in the two position of the uh, glucosamine. Okay, so let's leave the, the, the rational design perspective here aside. What I want to do here is to show you how we use these ligands just in a few slides. Um, 
So the first thing we did was to immobilize it on a liposomal formulation. So in this liposomal formulation, you have a dye attached so we can see where these uh, liposomes would bind. These are around 100 nanometer in size. And then also the glycomimetic, which would mediate the binding to lung green on the surface of the Langerhans cells. And for this, we get um, a skin from plastic surgery. We can uh, then make epidermal skin cell suspensions. That means that they're 2% roughly uh, of the cells in such a suspension are the targeted cells. And you can see here um, that the targeted cells take up the targeted liposomes very nicely. So this is the shift on the y-axis. This is the receptor expression on the x-axis. And if we do put EDTA into the solution, so if we sequester the calcium, we don't see this uptake anymore for obvious reasons. You remember it's the central calcium coordinating the ligand. And if we don't use the ligand at all, it's also no uptake. And overall, looking at all of the cell types that are available in such a mixture from the, um, from the skin cell suspensions, we only see uptake uh, into the Langerhans cells, those cells that we wanted to target. And with this, we can move forward so we can make um, a particles or even directly labeled proteins that can pass the stratum corneum, so the upper layer of your skin, to deliver this material to the Langerhans cells in the epidermis. They will then metrate, migrate into the next lymph node and activate the immune system. And just to showcase that we can actually do this in intact human skin, um, what we have done is used either intradermal injection with conventional needles or um, microneedle injectors that you can see here from the company Nanopass, uh, where we can inject directly labeled GFP because we can easily uh, follow this um, in this uh, intact piece of skin. And also here in the complex environment of the human skin, we can see that the uh, targeted GFP is taken up exactly by the Langerhans cells, which are CD45, HLA-DR, uh, and CD1A high positive uh, cells, and CD14 negative cells. All of the other cell types that we find in the skin do not take up the particles in a significant um, amount, or take up the, the targeted protein. Okay, so with this, I wanted to, let's say, motivate why we do all of this, uh, why we try to find small molecules for lectins, and how we can move this then to something beneficial for human health. Um, and now let me go a few steps back and tell you how we actually find ligands and what we learn about the last three in all of this. So first of all, when we take a look at the lectins, and this is um, langurine that you can see here, uh, they, they look horrible uh, from a medicinal chemistry perspective, right? So it's, it's uh, flat hydrophilic surfaces, um, with the calcium in the primary site and all of the druggability prediction service that we had used in the, in the very past uh, told us not to touch these proteins. And also from the crystal structures, they look quite rigid. Um, so one of the first things we did was using a fluorinated uh, small molecule fragment library to use an NMR screening. So you can see some representatives, the library is around 340 members by now. Uh, so they're very small and non-complex molecules that we can use for screening. They were chosen for having a high diversity uh, based on their scaffolds, on their three-dimensionality, uh, using max fingerprints and also using pharmacophore fingerprints to have a, a small, very diverse set, uh, as you can see here. And the, the good thing about all of them being fluorinated is that we can easily screen them. So we can put up to 40 fragments in one screening cocktail. Each of the fragments will give rise to a single peak. And if you then add the receptor, uh, either the lines completely disappear or broaden significantly. So it's a very fast readout. Also recording such a spectrum takes maybe a minute or so. So we can screen the entire fragment library in about half a day. And then it takes maybe another day for data evaluation and really tell us how many hits we have. And already this number of hits per target gives us an impression on how amendable these target, uh, target proteins are um, for the application of finding small molecule drugs. And actually, we were very surprised to find that the proteins that I just told you are flat and hydrophilic are very amendable for small heterocycles uh, to be bound. So we have hit rates up to uh, 16%, which is really high. So the average, I would say, in fragment-based designs around 
So um, to further confirm this high drug ability, we uh, also teamed up with uh, Professor Osada at, at Riken, and uh, they had developed uh, photo affinity linker chemistry on glass slides. So you shine light, uh, this um, converts this uh, diazerine here in the radical carbene in this position, inserting or reacting with your small molecule that you print on the glass slide. So we can basically print our entire fragment library on a glass slide, so on a glass array and do uh, microarray screening. And you can see the results here. So um, the, the signal to noise was, was okay. We could even um, immobilize different concentrations of each of the fragments. Importantly, what we found is that what we had already seen in uh, fluorine NMR correlates nicely with the hit rates uh, that we also get on the array. So even there, the, the lectins seem to be amendable for drug-like uh, molecules to be screened. A third indication that uh, lectins are actually binding small molecules of, of uh, heterocyclic uh, uh, nature and can be modulated by this came from a cell-based screening assay. Uh, so here the, the central and determining idea is to use a um, reporter, in this case it was FITC labeled DEX strain that would be recognized by the lectins on the surface of the cell and can be competed off um, by small molecules. And I initially thought, okay, uh, th that's not going to work because you have two multivalent interfaces trying to bind very tightly to the reporter. You cannot displace this with a small molecule. And actually I was wrong. So um, we, we saw very good Z factors for the screening setup and we can even go to uh, when we use natural ligands like mannose to IC50s in the, in the millimolar regime, so 4.7 millimolar with good signal to noise. So we could use this assay uh, to screen against different targets. So you can see here the human lung ring and the DC sign. And we screened about uh, almost a thousand fragments um, with uh, good reproducibility in a flow cytometry uh, setup. And the flow cytometry setup is a key here because we can, uh, before we do the the screening, we can even pool four different cell lines into the same well, and they all bind to the same receptor. So we would get IC50 curves for four targets at the same time uh, in parallel. So we save a little bit of time and, and, uh, and money. So we usually started here with about 55 hits from the primary screening, could validate 29, then get good dose response curves of about 14. And those were uh, confirmed with uh, HSQC NMR, reported displacement NMR, and most importantly for us to really believe that a hit is really a hit <laughs> um, is to do a, a short structure activity relationship. So um, surrounding this, and you can see one hit here for DC sign. Uh, we ended up with a 80 micromolar uh, affinity ligand from this um, fragment screening in the first place. So this was also an indicator that these horribly looking proteins are actually amenable to small molecule binding. Now the question came up, why? <laughs> okay, what, what happens? Uh, is there any sort of dynamics going on? And obviously uh, I wouldn't be in the Allot Consortium if we wouldn't uh, find out that this is an elastic protein. So our first insights came from very simple experiments. We wanted to know um, for, in this case, human langurine, What's the affinity for calcium, okay? So we used HSQC NMR, where each of these dots that you can see here uh, represents one amino acid um, of the protein. We wanted to know um, if calcium binds, which amino acids are actually affected? And our expectation was that only in the short periphery where the chemical environment of those amino acids will change because of the binding of calcium, you will see what we will call chemical shift perturbations. What we actually found, and that's why this is such a disturbing wild picture up left, is that many residues were affected by the binding of the calcium in this side over here. So even in remote sites, 20 angstrom away, you would see changes in the chemical environment of those resonances, which means that either there is a change in dynamics or a change in the environment of, of the amino acids, so something's happening all over the place. And together with uh, Bettina Keller at the Freie Universität Berlin, 
Um, we looked into this a little bit deeper. Uh, so she did the molecular dynamic simulation and used uh, mutual information. So a dimensionless correlation function from uh, information theory to find out if I know something about residue A, about their side chains, do I also know something about residue B? So is there correlated mobility? And this is the plot that you can see here on the left side. So these are all the amino acids of, of lung green. And we see the normalized mutual information plots connecting residues that are either close in distance or even further away, still being able to have correlated mobilities of their side chains. And with this information, we could explain the chemical shift perturbations, how this is promoted um, in, in, let's say, the hydrogen bonding network. And here are a couple of pictures of the hydrogen bonding network that connects the uh, the, the central calcium ion with other residues, even in the shorter loop that is uh, 15, 20 angstrom away. Yeah. So, so we argued if we um, if these these spots in the protein are really connected with one another, we could also mutate. Uh, is it good? I think you're also not muted. So if we argued uh, so. Um, if we mutate or if we introduce mutations at very remote sites, they should also have introduce chemical shift perturbations, so changes in the chemical environment somewhere else in the protein. So we set up a bunch of, uh, of um, uh, mutants, and first of all, could confirm that all of these mutants still bind calcium, okay, even though they're they are far away. But what we could also see is that if we introduce a mutation back here, we could see chemical shift perturbations here and the other way around. So we had a reciprocal um, connectivity between very remote sites in the protein, leading us to the definition of around, uh, I think it was 24 uh, amino acids in a conserved uh, allosteric network that you can see here. The conservation we also analyzed, so we looked into um, uh, other species, uh, the lung green, and you can see for those amino acids involved in the allosteric network, we actually have a high conservation score. Okay, so with this, uh, even though the picture from the crystallography looks very static and uh, hydrophilic, we knew already that there is all sorts of mobility in our protein. So on the nanosecond time scale, uh, picosecond time scale, we have side chain mobilities. Uh, micro to millisecond time scale, we knew from NMR that there's loop mobility. We even have a, a cis to trans isomerization in one of the loops of a cysteine, uh, sorry, of a proline, of course that is a very slow movement of one of the loop structures. Okay. So um, the next step for us was then uh, for related protein for the murine ortholog to start a drug discovery campaign. So here we used saturation transfer difference as the primary screening uh, tool. So again, just let me repeat this for STDNMR, you basically transfer magnetization from the receptor to the binding and exchanging ligand, even better those protons that stick into the binding set of the protein would receive more saturation. So you not can, only, not can only say if something bound, but also uh, how it bound into the binding site. So for screening, um, uh, we, we used a fragment library of about, I think, 1,000 or 1,400 small molecules. In the absence of the receptor, you should not see any resonances. If you do, like in this expansion over here, it's a good indication for indication for aggregating false positive. Then you add the receptor and you get resonances, so STD effects from the saturation transfer to this uh, small molecule. And if we then add a competitor, calcium was the only thing we had in hand back then, uh, we reduce these signals, as you can see here in the overlay, meaning that it's calcium competitive. Over here, we have a representative that is not calcium competitive. So we ruled this out. This was not so interesting for us at that moment. And at the same time, we would also get uh, from the hits, the STD epitope maps, meaning we know which parts of the small molecule face the receptor sites and which face the solvent site. So again, First thing we do is a small structure activity relationship you can see here on the right side, just to confirm that either with chemistry we can destroy the binding or we can enhance the binding, doesn't matter so much, uh, just that it's not very flat, okay? Of course, we are happy if it improves the binding. Um, from the screening, we not only get this uh, 
that's tired solo uh, pyrimidinones um, as a, a hit scaffold, but also like thiophenes you can see here, or these, these other um, uh, dihydroindines or isoindolines. The, the central point here that I wanted to make is of course something in fragment-based discovery that we often face. The question, uh, how do you prioritize hit series? Okay, so you need an SAR to know it's real, but how do you move forward? And here we came back to our um, small molecule arrays. So we basically printed these series on the glass slide, asking the question, which series is less destroyed or even enhanced um, with a photodiazerine random insertion into the scaffold? Okay, so which structure is more amendable to such a, a radical chemical modification. And here the teratsonopyrimidinones um, stood out and this is why we carried on with it. Carrying on uh, doesn't necessarily mean directly that we go into fragment growing. I mean, we didn't have a structure then and we still don't have it, but what we uh, usually do is a re-scaffolding. So using um, Max fingerprints, uh, pharmacophore fingerprints and smarts, we, used, we were searching for matched pairs to just see if we can change the chemical tractability of the central core structure. And uh, we did this very extensively and basically found that the initial hit structure uh, were the best to carry on with. But I think it was still a very good exercise to do and find out more about the affinities of closely related small molecules in an experimental setup. And here we then teamed up um, with uh, Marc Nazaré and his team. So they then used the central scaffold that we identified and uh, set up a full-blown parallel synthesis of over, I think, 200 small molecule derivatives uh, that we then also tested in SPR and NMR. Uh, so I can briefly guide you through the, the SAR. Uh, so in the seventh position, uh, we didn't see much improvement uh, of the affinity um, in the uh, two position here, uh, neither nor in the three position. But when we then uh, turn to the sixth position uh, with an amide linkage, uh, we could even go down to uh, 80 or 90 uh, micromolar in affinity. And if we add this additional hydroxyl group where we suspect this changes, flips the binding mode, we go down to 180 micromolar. The important point is actually not so much the affinity. I think we're still far away from a, a, something that we can use as an inhibitor in an in vivo situation. But what we found is that these small molecules do not bind uh, directly in the carbohydrate binding site. I mean, this is very hydrophilic and flat. There must be a secondary site. So first of all, they are about a thousand fold better than the, the natural ligand, which is good. Uh, from HSQC NMR, we knew that they're not sharing the same binding site. They even have detrimental effects on some of the uh, remote residues in the allosteric network. But overall, we could formulate an hypothesis where in absence of calcium, there would not be any binding pocket available for the fragments. In the presence, this pocket would uh, open up. They could bind and block carbohydrate binding or the other way around. If the carbohydrates are bound, this will then inhibit uh, in an allosteric fashion the binding of the fragments. Okay, so this is the, the second uh, showcase that I wanted to make highlighting how we investigate LS3 here. And now let me come to a a related protein. Here for this related protein, we had also done a lot of biophysical screening. So you're now aware of how we do protein-based NMR. I've shown you some of the fluorine and STD NMR techniques to do ligand-based NMR. We have also done microarrays and I'm not mentioning here the SPR. Out of this whole uh, uh, fragment campaign, we identified five secondary sites that are distributed over the protein over DC sign. Um, here you can see some of the hits so that you get a feeling for affinities and how they look like. And interestingly, uh, a few years later, then the Fong Fieschi's group also confirmed some of the binding sites with crystallography. So here we can see that uh, his uh, glycomimetic structures are facing into some of the pockets that we had predicted back then. So there are, also on that protein, secondary sites, and most likely these are also allosteric sites. And very recently, um, we have made use of these allosteric sites for DC sign. Again, from a, coming into this project from a targeted delivery perspective, we used liposomes as a 
uh, as a first line of uh, liposome or a lipid nanoparticle formulation to, to test our hypotheses. So we had these liposomes either made with mannose, which is a natural ligand of DC sign, or with this glycomimetic drug that we had uh, identified uh, from a structure activity relationship campaign um, on the labeled liposomal formulations. And what we can see here is that the glycomimetic drug by itself, regardless how much of it is formulated into the liposomes, does not give rise to any cellular uptake that you can see here on the y-axis. For mannose, only very high concentration of mannose are, um, are necessary, are successful in allowing the uptake into the cell. This was also known, mannose is a weak ligand. You need a lot on the surface of the particles. Now, the interesting thing comes that if we combine the two, even at low concentrations of mannose and low concentrations of the glycomimetic, we see a super synergistic effect from these two molecules being present on the same particle and we get uh, five-fold or even higher-fold uh, binding in, into the, or binding onto the cells and uptake into the cells that are DC sign expressing. The close relative lungrene, which also binds to mannose, does not bind to any of them. So this is basically confirming our specificity here. And we can do the typical control experiments. We can use EDTA to remove the binding to the carbohydrate. You remember the central calcium ion is sequestered, no binding to the lectin anymore. So that's shown in gray. We can also use mannan as a polysaccharide, also competing for the mannocyte, removing all binding. So how can we explain this effect? Um, and there, obviously, we're, we're getting closer to LS3 again. And this is why I, I bring this example here. So we, again, make use of biophysics, so um, STD NMR experiment. So if you run an STD exper NMR experiment with DC sign and the glycomimetic, you will find that the biphenyl substituent binds very well to the protein as well as does the, the carbohydrates uh, scaffold. If we add EDTA and remove the carbohydrate binding, you can see that most of this interaction actually comes from the biphenyl substituent, indicating that this, pro, uh, this ligand has two sites for recognition. One is the carbohydrate site, and the second is the biphenyl substituent uh, recognition site. So maybe one of the secondary sites that I introduced to you earlier on the slide before. And insights again came from protein NMR. So in the presence of calcium, most of the resonances that are perturbed by the binding of the glycomimetic are closed to the carbohydrate binding site. In presence of EDTA, so the removal of the calcium, we see only binding in the secondary site down here. Okay, so this might be the site where we have the biphenyl substituent uh, binding to the protein. Uh, we did also did with um, Carlos Modinuti, we, we did uh, docking experiments where we have an indication of where this could potentially sit in the binding site over here. Uh, Carlos also predicted the mutant with a uh, phenylalanine in this position blocking the site, and this is what we did. So we mutated the site into the phenylalanine, and then we didn't see uh, significant chemical shift perturbations upon binding anymore. This was then also further confirmed using site as a prediction server for potential allosteric sites, and we could also see that the site server would say, okay, this is a potential uh, a site for um, modulating the protein. So overall, let me just uh, uh, summarize this, this part here as well. So we have on our targeted vehicle, we can have the binding into the natural car uh, carbohydrate binding site coordinated by the calcium and also the binding into the secondary site, which allosterically activates the primary site bringing us the super synergistic effect that I showed you earlier. Okay, so in the last few minutes, uh, let's move to uh, bacterial lectins. So uh, as I also promised in the title, uh, we also uh, worked in a larger consortium here, for instance, together with Anne Berti and uh, Alexander Tietz and Didier Renaud um, on the development of uh, allosteric inhibitors or glycomimetics for bacterial lectins. And let me show you the, the case of Bumble. It's um, 
lectin from a pathogenic, pathogenic uh, bacteria that usually recognizes Foucault structures for building biofilms for invading uh, the human host. So again, from a biophysical screen, fluorine NMR, SPR, uh, HSQC, in this case, it was trosid-based uh, uh, dose dependencies. We identified this fragment over here with a decent affinity, 0.3 millimolar. Uh, because it was fluorinated, we could then directly deduce uh, the affinity from fluorine-based NMR. Uh, and we also employed another trick that I have not uh, talked about yet, and that is feeding the bacteria during the growth phase with 5-fluoroindole. So they take this up, this material, and implement this as 5-fluorotryptophans into the proteins that they make. And this really works nicely. So we could have all of the tryptophans, you can see them highlighted here, all surrounding the primary binding site for the natural carboided ligand, 5-fluorolabeled. Okay, and this is nice because then we can also do titration experiments with fragments that we find binding and also deduce the KDs from this in very simple spectra. I will show you a few spectra of those in the next slide. So we had also found more um, fragments that would bind to Bumble, uh, similar process, short SAR, uh, competition experiments, and so on. And together with a sitemap, uh, a tool to predict potential secondary sites, we identified a few of them on the surface of this uh, beta propeller protein. Um, and from HSQC, so first of all, from Glide, docking into these sites, we already had an idea that they would somehow all fit into the same site. Uh, and this was further confirmed by HSQC NMR. So looking again at chemical shift perturbations of the protein in presence of these ligand inhibitors or potential activators, uh, seeing that they all leave the same fingerprint, meaning many of the resonances that are perturbed by these small molecules are the same. So even though we don't have the backbone assignment of Bumble, we know that they should bind into the same binding site because they do the same thing to the protein, okay? which then further confirmed our docking results that these would at least fit into the same site. Okay. The, the idea that this could be an allosteric site, first of all, came from the fact that uh, the, the secondary site was not sharing the, um, the orthosteric site and competition experiment with a known ligand. And this known ligand, the uh, 2-deoxy-2-fluorofucose, uh, could not replace our uh, fragment hits completely, so only up to uh, 30% which is a good indicator for um, a partial antagonist here. We could also go back to the fluorinated tryptophan, so we could monitor how our small molecules bind uh, and modulate the tryptophans in the primary site. Again, all the three fragments that I showed you share the same site. This is why they do the same thing to the protein, even in the simplified spectra. But, and this is still puzzling us a bit, um, in this type of assay, we didn't see competition with uh, the known ligand. So we're, um, we were still unsure whether this is really an allosteric mechanism or if we just rely on one assay. This is where we then turned again to the same trick that I showed you earlier for, for Langurine and that's a site-directed mutagenesis. So again, we, we argued if you we mutate remote sites, and if there is an allosteric network, this should also lead to chemical shift perturbations all over the place. So we had uh, about seven uh, mutants that were distributed uh, in the protein. And we, again, followed their chemical shift perturbations in an HSQC, so following uh, whether mutations in the remote site would lead to chemical shift perturbations somewhere else. And we could see that. So for all of the mutants, the chemical shift perturbation maps, even though we don't have the assignment, are very similar, indicating that there is an allosteric network at play. Okay, and with this, I would like now to, to close this, this uh, chapter overall and give you a short summary. Uh, first of all, we, we started from uh, lectin binding sites and they're very challenging. So all of the lectin binding sites that I have had a look at, they're usually very flat and hydrophilic per se. But with very sensitive biophysical screening methods, um, 
I hope I could convince you, we can actually identify those sites. We can understand allosteric networks. Um, for Langrine, I showed you this. For murine Langrine, we have even moved forward to develop allosteric inhibitors. Um, for DC sign, we use those uh, active, actually we used activators to activate the primary site by co-presenting uh, an allosteric activator on the same vehicle. And finally, I ended up with our work on Bumble, where we have, let's, let's say, the start with uh, a 300 micromolar uh, allosteric inhibitor uh, to develop uh, novel antibiotics. And with this, let me finish and thank the people in the lab who, who did the work. You can see them here in the pictures, um, the funding agencies for the money. And I hope I was able to mention all of the collaborators that were involved in our work here. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions.